All right, welcome back, everybody. We're just going to continue with our content as far as our intro to anatomy unit. Uh, so not too bad. Um, as far as that's concerned, we don't have too much left. Um, making good progress. Like I said, pretty short unit overall. So where we left off, we were on the lymphatic system. So as far as the lymphatic system, I was mentioning that it is a unit or a system that is going to be more oriented around uh, picking up excess fluid that leaks from the blood vessels. Uh, it's also going to help dispose of ex any debris that it picks up. And one of the most important things is that it helps to create lymphocytes, specialized white blood cells that help to attack foreign substances in the body. All right, next we have respiratory system. As far as respiratory system is concerned, uh, there's a lot of complexities to it, but the simple truth behind it is that it keeps the blood supplied with oxygen, removes carbon dioxide. So another way of approaching that would just be something like oxygen is good, carbon dioxide is bad. I know that's simplistic, but that's literally what we're trying to approach here, right? You want more oxygen in your blood. You want to get rid of carbon dioxide as soon as you can. Gas exchange will occur through the walls of the air sacs in these alveoli, these alveolar sacs, as we call them. They're very, very, very small, super thin. Uh, it allows for high surface tension. It allows for gases to exchange very rapidly. So these are structures we'll learn much more about when we do respiratory system. Okay, next we have digestive system. Digestive system is a pretty straightforward one. A lot of us do really well in that unit. It's all about breaking food down. So you eat a burger. How does that burger translate into the smallest particles that can then be absorbed into the blood that you can use for nutrition? That's kind of the concept, at least. There's obviously more to it. I do like this diagram here that I'm going to circle for us. The reason why I like that diagram a lot is because it kind of strips everything apart and makes it super simplistic. It just shows, hey, you know, yes, on the left-hand side here, this is what it really ends up looking like, a lot of twists and turns and a lot of intricacies. But if you take that all away, it's really just one long tube that goes from the mouth to the anus. Granted, there's a lot of pit stops along the way, but that's stuff that we'll get there as we progress. Another big thing to understand is that in the digestive system, in our digestion, we cannot digest everything we consume. We're just not capable of that. So there are some certain foods that we consume that are indigestible. And those indigestible foods we process through. Our large intestine tries to do its best that it can with the bacteria. But anything left, we get rid of as fecal matter. So we do a pretty good job of cleaning up anything that our body just physically can't handle any longer. Urinary system. As far as urinary system is concerned, Again, it's a unit that we don't spend too much time with. It's a short unit for me. Uh, but the urinary system is helpful for many very important reasons. First of all, it helps to eliminate waste. Well, I just mentioned how the digestive system eliminates waste. That's correct. The digestive system is going to be eliminating food waste, whereas the urinary system is going to be helping to eliminate blood waste. Specifically, what, what starts to build up in the blood is called nitrogenous waste. This is stuff that can be harmful to you. So your kidneys filter the blood and convert that waste product into something that can be stable, the urine. Urine inevitably will be excreted out of the body and you're good to go, right? Uh, the kidneys and the urinary system overall also play a vital role in regulating key components of your blood's balance. So that includes water, electrolyte levels, and acid-base balance. Super important stuff that we're going to get into as we continue in our unit. Reproductive system. I'm sorry. Reproductive system. This is one of the last units we'll cover in our course. The overall purpose of the reproductive system is always procreate, right? Create new life. No doubt about it. But what's interesting is that us and a couple other species that we coexist with, most of the animal kingdom does not follow this, this rule, by the way, but a couple other animals... Um, are known to have sexual activity for pleasure. Uh, so in, again, in the rest of the animal kingdom, that's not normally the case. Humans and some other animals do, but it's not normally what we observe. Uh, we're obviously going to learn about the sexual organs in both men and women. And the testes, how they produce sperm, which are the sex cells, and the testes also produce testosterone, whereas ovaries are going to produce these ova or eggs, and the, ova, the ovaries are also producing estrogen and progesterone. 
Lastly, we do understand or we do go through the steps of fertilization. So the sperm infusing the egg, uh, gestation, so development further into the embryonic stage and inevitably uh, being born through labor. But one thing that all mammals share in common is breastfeeding. The ability to feed your young is a necessity. So the mammary glands in women will produce milk after they've given birth to a child. Now, the interesting thing is, is that with modern science, not everyone has to do that. You know, there are some women that flat out cannot breastfeed, some women that choose not to breastfeed, regardless of what the decision may be. Formula does a pretty good job of replicating the essential components necessary that breast milk would have. Okay, a little bit more here. The anatomical position. We need a starting point when you're looking at a human body. Like how do we just get, how do we get started? So it's a common visual reference point. It's straightforward. If you do yoga, this is actually the similar pose that you'd stand in in what's called mountain pose. But very straightforward pose. Feet hip width apart. You're standing straight. Shoulders relax, you're looking ahead, your arms at your side, your palms away from you, and your thumbs kind of resting away as well. The point of this pose is so that a medical professional could examine you from head to toe. In most cases, a doctor is not going to say, hey, can you stand in the anatomical position? No. They'll probably just tell you, hey, do you mind just standing straight up for me? Relax your arms. That's it. That's pretty close to this. So it gives us the same idea. And finally, this is where we're going to finish for today. We have some regional terms that we need to know. We have axial and appendicular. Axial is referring to the axis of the body. Now, what I like to think of when I think of the axis of the body is I like to think of the tree metaphor. So I'm going to go ahead and say it's the trunk of the body. So where is the trunk? So here's what we see in the bottom here, axial region. The trunk is everything. Well, oh, not that far. Hold on. I'll redraw that. The trunk is everything in here. So from the waist all the way up to the head, we consider that the axial region or the trunk. Whereas appendicular, interestingly enough, let me go to change color for you guys so I can identify something different. The, oh, sorry. The appendicular region, the word appendicular to me, reminds me of appendage. Well, appendage is a synonym for limbs. Okay. We're starting to understand a little bit of the connections here, right? So your limbs are going to be all the appendicular regions. That's what we observe. And in our tree analogy that I was just referencing, the appendicular region, I would consider that more the branches. of a tree. So that's very basic terminology. Tomorrow, we're going to get more into more detailed terminology that is associated to regions. But the reason why we have these names for regions of the body is so that we can standardize the terms. Again, the example I like to give is that imagine if you're a surgeon and you're in a room full of other surgeons and doctors and nurses and medical professionals. It would not look good if a surgeon handed you a scalpel and said, okay, we're about to start the incision in the upper area upper area. That's too vague. What does that mean? So instead, you can rephrase that. And I know what I'm about to say still sounds very vague. <laughs> you would need to be more detailed regardless. But this is more specific, at least. You could say we're about to start an incision in the upper limb. That at least indicates it's, a, it's an arm. You need to be more specific, no doubt about it. But that at least gives us a little bit more information. Okay. So guys, that's what we're going to finish for today. Again, we're chunking it, keeping it easy, trying to pace ourselves. Not too bad. Um, but we're on slide 20, making good progress. So I'll see you guys in the next one. Have a good one.